This is the Gauntlet Podcast. My name is Jason. I am joined by my co-host, Lowell Francis. Hi, Lowell. Hey, Jason. And we are joined for this episode by our guest, game designer and frequent Codex contributor, Jesse Ross. Jesse, welcome to the Gauntlet Podcast. Hi, thanks for having me. Listeners, this is our Hangouts Roundup. I want to talk a little bit real briefly before we begin about a slight format change that we are doing this year for the Gauntlet Podcast. So now we're going to have two episodes per month, like normal, but the way it's going to work is both episodes will be like we were previously doing once a month. We're going to do that twice a month now. And one episode will be myself, Lowell, and a guest. In this case, it's Jesse. And the other episode every month will be Lowell, a Sherry, and a guest. So that is the format there. We're also changing the second segment. We are now going to dedicate the second segment to a topic that the guest wants to discuss. So if the guest has a game they want to promote or they have a project they're working on or anything like that, that's their opportunity to do so. And so with all of that in mind, and with all that said, Lowell, how was your January in gaming? So I'm kind of covering the, the January, December, because there's some interesting things I didn't have a chance to talk about. So off Gauntlet, I did Urban Shadows, Trailer Cthulhu, 13th Age, Changing the Lost PPTA, a game written by Jesse, Working Stiffs. And then on Gauntlet, I did three different series of Hearts of Ulin. Three? Wow. <laughs> yeah. Including finishing up a quarterly series. Nice. nice. I did Threadbare, Masks. I did Darren's Hilt Blade, a playtest of that. And then the game I want to talk about actually is City of Mist from December, because this is a game that when I put it up, it filled very fast, and I put a second set of it up, and that filled very fast, and people were really excited about it. And I want to talk about my experience running that. Sure, yeah. Now, City of Mist, I want to, full disclosure, I ran the starter set back in the day when it first came out. I backed the Kickstarter. I backed the most recent Kickstarter because Chris Spivey and Mark D.S. Truman were writing for it. And so I have put some, some money into this. It is a PBTA-driven game with some real tweaks to PBTA basis, and it's sort of superhero-ish. It's noir as well. It's a strange city that's kind of a modern mythic city. It's not clear that there's anything really outside the city. The characters are riffs. They are the embodiments of stories like myths or fictional characters or ideas. So you might be the rift of Alice in Wonderland, or you might oh, be the rift of Zeus. And th there are all kinds of implications with that. I focused on myth things for mine, you know, a Russian set and a Greek set for that, just to kind of give myself some very specific and kind of more common basis. It's called City of Myths because there's also this idea that there's a mist out there that can hide this from the mundane world and it can also erase memories and it can even erase our rift characters memories and it can can change all of those things so it's a superhero game with a lot of other weirdness to it okay now i love superhero stuff you know that's definitely my wheelhouse i know it's not necessarily yours jason but i like i, 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 I i'm not yeah i don't yeah. care about superhero stuff yeah it's just it's always left me cold yes yeah, for, but for me i love superheroes i love high fantasy those are, are things i dig so for this game, there are a lot of really interesting bits to it. We have these theme books. Your character is made up of four theme books that are kind of like, this is my theme book about relationships, or this is my theme book about being able to change myself. Are they are they a bit like mini playbooks then? or No, because there aren't really playbooks for the characters. Essentially, they kind of define a set of abilities, a set of powers, that then provide a set of tags. And then like Lady Blackbird, when you go to do roles, you're picking tags from the various places. It's a little involved, so I'm not doing a great job of getting to it, but it's the only sort of moves are on the basic side. Mm. So this is more of a sort of superhero building with a set of four different choices that you kind of put together and make some sub choices on. It's a neat thing. Like the, the choices that you have are broken into logos versus mythos. And 
logos means like real world stuff like my character was a cop or i'm in love with this person or you know i have experience as a boxer those are all kind of things that could give you abilities and then the mythos things are the power things like you know i can absorb energy or i can change my body form or things like that and the balance of those, like if you have your four cards, so if you have three mythos and one logos, it means that you're more tending towards, you know, kind of crazy power stuff. And the reverse is true, that it turns towards the mundane. And in fact, if you go all the way either way, you actually lose your character. Oh, wow. Because hmm. They forget that they're a super being or they become too much. And there's some mechanics in there for flipping those cards. Like if you actually burn out one of your theme books – you have to flip it to the other type. So if I burn out my my superpower, I have to f- flip it to a a normal thing. It's it's really cool. I mean, really great stuff. It sounds really interesting. Yeah. yeah. I mean, like I'm not into superheroes, but I love noir, and I and I I particularly love this idea of the rifts. Like that's a super interesting approach. Yeah, the idea of a kind of a balancing for superhero identity in a concrete way that plays in your powers, I think is really solid. One of the things they have is you have an additional theme book that everybody in the crew shares. That is the theme book for your crew. And you answer some questions about that. And it really shapes what the game's going to be, whether you're going to be private detectives or whether you're going to be masked vigilantes or whether you're going to be modern gods. And it's a nice little technique. It's, it's a clever idea, something I would steal for other games the game has some other mechanics, like at the start of session, somebody can do a voiceover <laughs> where they do their internal monologue. And I think that's actually one of the few places where they actually do some supporting of the noir idea. Downtime is is described as a photo montage, and there's some great mechanics in there. And the concept is good, and the book is super, super pretty. It's it's gorgeous. Like this for a first Yeah. <laughs> for a first time product, it is amazingly well laid out the art is consistent some of the art i don't dig but it's all consistent and the color choices are really interesting and all of that is solid i'm sensing a butt here (laughs) yeah (laughs) so i'm really not sure about this game you're not sure you said you're not sure about this game really not sure about this game and we had a good time but it was one of those times where i can definitively say it was a good time because i had good players because mm-hmm. I had people that were into it mm-hmm. because of the table, but I was fighting and struggling against the system throughout. Did you feel like the game wasn't supporting you enough or wasn't hitting the mark that it was aiming for or something else? I think there's a mix of that. What you're saying is really is sharp on one side of it. It wants to be noir and it has a few bits that support that, but in general... I think RPGs do a terrible job of supporting noir play. Like Blood Shadows or Edge of Midnight, these are other noir games that just have the trappings. They're they're wearing the clothing of noir, but they're not hitting the themes. They're not playing into those concepts. And I think City Mist has that same issue as those other games. Mm -hmm. And that may be a general issue rather than a specific one to to City of Mist. Would you say in general with role-playing games, the difficulty with noir is that they nail the aesthetic of noir, but not necessarily the themes and the sort of vibe of noir? Yeah, it's kind of the same problem that Sherry has with steampunk is that steampunk is all aesthetic (laughs) and, and where there could be themes, they aren't there. So it's a little bit like that. It's also, I'll say my, one of my big issues, and then I'm going to talk about the mechanical issues I have. Okay. This is a beautiful 500 page book and it has no index. <laughs> Ouch. 500 pages. Wow. It's 500 that's, pages. That's it has big. no index. Jeez. And this is a game with sidebar rules and places where the rules are kind of out of logical order hmm. and there's no index. Just recently they put out like a, a sheet that has like an eight page sheet that has page references, but even that doesn't really cover it. And the lack of index is painful at the table. Trying to find it either physically or via the, the document, it's it's really it really shows, and I don't understand that choice. So they they produced a really beautiful quick start for it as a part of the Kickstarter. And yep. is there value in just running that? Like is there sort of too much in the book? I think that the if you want to do character creation, you're gonna need the book. 
And mm. I think the character okay. creation stuff and the background is all very interesting. And if you want that, you're going to need it. And it's it's kind of a stripped down version of it. But even in the quick starter, problems that I saw there are still here in the bigger version, You're still here in the, the final version. It relies on some basic moves. There are more basic moves than it needs to have. Some of them overlap in a way where even by the last sessions of both things I ran, we were still like, okay, what's the difference between go toe to toe versus hit it with all you've got? Mm, yeah. And there are other places where there are, are problems. Here is the big one. And it was something I was worried about when I ran the starter set. And it's something that really showed for me when we, when we went to play this. Now, I've run Fate. I like Fate. I'm one of the people on the, the gauntlet that, that digs it. I can run with aspects and advantages, you know, tags that you put on the table. I keep them tight. I don't put too many on the, on the table because I don't want to track that much stuff. But I can use them, and, and they're, they're good. This game is built entirely on those kinds of things. There are these tracking cards, and these tracking cards track tags. They track statuses, and then they track clues, and then they also track juice. The most important being these tags and statuses, statuses that happen to you, tags that you put on other people, and they matter. Like, the scene is supposed to have tags. When you do something, you create a tag. If you want to help somebody by spending your juice, which is hold, juice, uh, yeah. spending your juice... <laughs> You don't you don't do it to give them a bonus. You have to create a tag that will give them a benefit and then and go on. And everything is about manipulating those those tags and the statuses and all of that. And they are numbered. So okay. a tag and a status can go from level one to level six. And like damage is like if you take physical damage. That's like a status, and if multiple people are doing it and they're kind of close, it's on the same quote-unquote spectrum, those build up, and when you get to level five, then you get taken out. But how do I, how do I put this? That track of one to six, it's one tick for level one. Okay. One tick for level two. Okay. Two ticks for level three. Three ticks for level four. <laughs> uh, four ticks for level five. So there are all these ticks, so it goes up. So yeah. It's not like, okay, I did six points to you. Well, I did six points. Let's see how many ticks. Well, that takes us up to level three. And so not only do I have to track these things, which is how you do damage, which is how you affect the scene, which is how you do conditions that people take, I have to track those and run those numbers up and down. I'm, I'm exhausted just listening to you talk yeah, about it. Yeah, it sounds I mean, very like, fiddly. <laughs> like, like it it's, seems like a lot. Like this is a lot. It's weirdly specific, and it's also weirdly undefined. Like it says, oh, yeah, you know – if someone has a status and it seems to affect them, then they'll suffer a penalty. And we've got all these like very specific tracks and then we get this very wishy and they might affect or they might not. And I think as a result, I played a very streamlined version because I didn't want to put all of these statuses and things that the game expects you to have on the table. Like, all the powers that the bad guys have are all about, okay, and they create this status when they come into a scene, or they do this thing, or they create this thing. It's it's madness to me. Maybe at the table, if you're used to fate, and you have these cards in front of you, and you're writing them in pen, and can do that, because they have these nice laminated cards you can get for them. I bet that's really cool. I bet that's really awesome for me online, and for me who has tried to get to games where we can track things more lightly, it was painful. That's too bad. Yeah. And so that that's my big problem with it. Now, here's the thing. Is it's cool ideas. It's got way too much crunch for me, and it would wear me down. I had great sessions. I had some wonderful social interaction sessions. I had some character arcs. There was a great Gossip Girl episode, as Agatha <laughs> put it, with the personal <laughs> interactions that we kind of got – and we were able to use some of the mechanics to support that. And my immediate thought is, okay, is there stuff I can steal out of this? Can I, you know, take some bits out of it or maybe can I retool it? Problem is that the architecture is so elaborately built. I don't know how you would 
re- to retool this without just taking out those concepts and bringing them somewhere else. So I just, I just want to say that. I do want to give a shout out, though. We use Roll20, and whoever did the Roll20 character sheets is amazing. Oh, because yeah. Because they have, like, the cards and the, the character sheet of these cards. And, like, you can click on them and they'll move forward and you can change things and you can flip them. And they've got the status cards down at the bottom. Whoever did this did an amazing job and they should be commended. And it helped. But it was not enough to make the game work for the way that I play these days. Three years ago, would you have loved City of Mist? I think 10 years ago, I would have loved City of Mist. <laughs> <Ten. laughs> yeah. All right. Because I might have been able to handle the tracking then, you know, because I was still playing like Storyteller and things like that with a lot of dice and a lot of, a lot of details and things. It's just got, it's got so much tracking. Yeah, I mean, like it. It's really interesting because I don't know much about the game to be honest. Like mm-hmm. mostly just what I've heard you've talked, what I've heard you talk about in the past. I kind of tune out on like superhero comic book stuff. We know that, so it's not something that was never going to catch my attention. But you know, the Kickstarters were undeniably successful and beautiful, and like it was, you know, it looked amazing. Just like as an observer, I was like, Jesus Christ, this looks amazing, right? What you've described and what I've kind of and I, what I remember even looking at the Kickstarter page was this doesn't really look like powered by the apocalypse to me. Like it looks like kind of something different, something a little more trad, a little bit crunchier. And that was my suspicion. Yeah. And so it's interesting that you're affirming it here. I mean, is this just down to taste at this point? I mean, is there like this sort of more maybe trad or crunchier kind of gamer who like would be really into this? Or like, does it also make like compromises there too? I think there's some some areas where it is a little a little flaky, but it feels closer to Cypher to me oh, okay yeah. where yeah. cypher is got a lot of really interesting stuff and a really some really interesting base mechanics and there are people that love it and i respect them and i ran it but it's like hey here's an indie game but then here's you know 500 pages of crunch to to, to add into your indie yeah game. yeah you know mm-hmm. and these days i'm leery of any game of pbta that has extensive damage tracking where mm-hmm. yeah. where we have to, like, we're clearly, the game is built for, we're going to have multiple rounds of combat, and that is about, you know, wearing the foe down. I, you know, it's so funny you say that, because I've been running your game, Hearts of Wulin, which I love, by the way, and that has such a, a beautiful, clean, elegant combat mechanic, and I've gotten, I've gotten so used to that. Also, my game, The Between, has a very, like, it's basically one-roll combat, right? I've gotten so used to that that when I ran Dungeon World a couple months ago, I was like, this is tedious. Like, I used to love Dungeon World (laughs) Combat, and I was like, holy shit, we're rolling again on the same monster. Uh, This is too much, you know? So, yeah, I kind of find myself kind of going to that place a little bit, too. Yeah, and, and, you know, hey, I'm running 13th Age. You know, I'm doing fights, fights that take an hour and a half, two hours, and we're, you know, I'm having fun with that. You know, I'm tracking the monster's hit points. It's not that I'm adverse to that, but... When the rest of the architecture is saying, oh, this ought to be fast and quick and, you know, the ni- nicely abstract. And it's kind of not. Yeah, it's an expectations thing, right? Yeah. yeah. I'm really glad it's out there. I'm really glad it's done well. And it's an interesting space that we're seeing with PBTA, people who are, are moving with some kinds of crunch. It is not to my taste. And I would definitely, if anyone were to ask me about buying it, I would say play it before you buy it. Yeah, I'm going to kind of keep going on this, like, tangent here about pbta design space but it's so funny because all three of us here on this call right now on this recording we are each writing powered by the apocalypse games that are pretty different from one another but they all share the quality of less right? mm-hmm. like a less yep. is more approach to power but like all three of these games girl underground hearts of uli in the between we're looking at apocalypse world and saying can we do less right <laughs> like like can can we strip away 30 percent here i don't know how that's going to help any of us on kickstarter we'll find right. out but i think it's like where my pbta design head is at right and so i do find myself a little bit like put out by some of these like these pbta games that are like just adding 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 stuff right like it's like oh, that's not what i want you know do you think that that has anything to do with the fact that we play most of our games online I, no, not at all. No. I, I don't think so at all. I think it honestly just comes down to we're all very familiar with Powered by the Apocalypse. And I think you play these games enough, you start to realize, well, this could be streamlined or this could be 
do we really need four moves for this? Can we get this down to mm-hmm. one move? Like, mm-hmm. you know, you start to like have those thoughts, right? And it becomes more about like structure and procedure, right? Girl Underground is a game with a quite specific structure. The Between is a game with a very specific structure, right? And structure and procedure will do a lot of the work, right? Genre will do a lot of the work as opposed to all these moves. So to that point about genre, because City of Mist has, it feels like it's layering genre, does it? Do you think that's part of why it needs this extra mechanical heft to help kind of smooth out the rough edges between those different pieces? No, I think it's because it's a superhero game. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> superhero game. I, I, mean, I mean, maybe just to be absolutely honest, I mean, all of the design decisions that are creating that crunch, all of that are about is about having superpowers in a superpowered game, and superpower design space is tough i think it's really difficult masks you know kind of throws away powers as a concept even worlds in peril kyle simon's game kind of goes you're going to really abstract powers we're just going to these moves Mm -hmm. and both of those games are still too much for me i wish they were still even less yeah and this one i think comes from the design space of people who've played probably other superhero games like mutants and masterminds or you know, champions or, I mean, I don't know what their background is, but it's certainly people who approach the superhero game. I mean, not necessarily specific powers. It's not a power list like, like mutants and masterminds. It's still very general, but then when we get to the the combat and the resolution, we've got all this, this crunch to represent that. Yeah. It's too bad. I mean, I can kind of see, you know, why you kind of reached some of these opinions on it. It sounds like a very interesting game, just thematically and conceptually. It does sound really interesting. Like it's probably one of the first superheroes things you've talked about in a long time that I've actually like, oh, that sounds really interesting, right? So yes, it's kind of too bad. But you know, you gave it at the very least, you know, you gave it a bunch of sessions. Yeah, <laughs> like, eight like, sessions. You, know, you put it those faces. Yeah. I mean, so I mean, you know, it's a legit opinion to have. So well awesome. Is there anything else you want to say about it? Ah, I think I think I've covered it and uh I wanted do you want to say if you like City of Mist, that is cool. I want to say to you, I wish I liked it. Well, let's move on. So, Jesse, tell us about uh, some of the games you played. Sure. It has been the winter of playtesting for me. (laughs) Nice. Okay, good. So, Off Gauntlet, I did uh, a couple sessions of this game called Sunset Kills, which is like kind of a mini Monster of the Week one-shot game that I've been working on as a way to introduce some friends to PBTA and story game sensibilities. On Gauntlet, I did some Monster Hearts, classic. And Trophy, which we'll talk a little bit about later. Love that too. Mm-hmm. And Lots of Girl Underground, which is what I wanted to talk about today. Nice. I don't think we've actually had a chance to talk about Girl Underground. Did Lauren talk about Girl Underground? Well, we talked yeah. about a little bit about it, yeah. Well, so maybe just give us an overview of it anyway. Sure, yeah. So Girl Underground is a Powered by the Apocalypse game about a curious girl in a wondrous world for telling stories like Alice in Wonderland and Labyrinth and Wizard of Oz and Spirited Away and all of those kind of portal fantasy stories about girls finding magical doorways to other worlds and having strange adventures on the other side. So it was written by, or it's it's being developed by you and Lauren McManaman. That's right. And listeners, you'll know Lauren as the editor of Codex Scene, and she was a guest a couple months ago or so on this program as well. Yeah. So what are you liking about it so far? Like, what is, why is, you know, why did you write this game? Like, what's going on with that? So I wrote it, well, one of the things that that has always jumped out to me about PBTA games is that they're, they're really good for genre emulation, right? Like, that's what, that's what Vincent and McGay Baker have said from the beginning. Or as I like to say, subgenre emulation. That's what they're really, really <laughs> Even good Even better, at, right? yeah. And I think both of you could attest to that in the games that you're working on. So I was looking around at what, genres I felt like could use the PBTA treatment and was surprised actually that there weren't more games for telling um, stories in this genre. Like Alice in Wonderland is a story that virtually everyone is familiar with and has some, some connection to, and it just seemed right for genre emulation. It seemed right for, for PBTA. I was talking to Lauren. This is sometime last year. It might have actually, I think it was at Camp Nerdly because we were roommates at Camp Nerdly. And Lauren was saying how role playing games tend to focus on all the negative aspects of mm-hmm. being a woman, right? right? Like all the terrible Bluebeard things bride. about being a woman. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like the watch. Yeah. They never tell the like 
happy, good stories of being a woman or being a girl, right? And so, you know, and she was saying, like, that's why Girl Underground was, like, so exciting for her. And I find that to be the case. Like, I I love its emphasis on girlhood Mm -hmm. and the development of girls and, indeed, the expectations that are put on girls and how the game kind of translates that that theme mechanically is is pretty good. So the the core of it is, I guess the the big premise is that as players, you are responsible collectively for playing the girl character. So there's there's a single character that everyone plays, which is the girl, and you start the game actually by by answering questions about her and getting everyone invested in in who this character is and really developing her personality, and then individually each person plays one of her companions throughout the game. So you sort of do this bouncing back and forth, looking at the girl sort of from the inside and from the outside. And because you're doing that, because you're, you're creating those jumps or having that perspective, you get to see what the girl is or who the girl is sort of externally and internally, which I think is, is a really nice, I think that's a really nice feature of the game. And I think works really well for kind of capturing the sentiments that we wanted out of the game. Well, so how'd your playtests go? Playtests were great. <laughs> they were they were really good. People are really jazzed about the game and having a lot of fun with it. Because it's a genre everyone knows, it's super easy for everyone to just get right into the headspace. And because it's so fantastical, nothing is off the table, which is also great. Like it's a game that that asks a lot of a GM in terms of helping construct a story and weaving all the threads together, but it also really shines when you have players who are active participants and want to contribute and see themselves almost as as co-GMs or co-facilitators in the story. In terms of the structure of it, is it positioned purely as a one-shot or is it positioned as a, as a longer term? How is How would you imagine that yeah, right now? That is a great question, Lowell, and, and something that we struggled with actually quite a bit. Mm-hmm. I I really wanted to be able to run it as a one shot because I like that that sort of self-contained story but we were finding it really difficult to do that. I think oh. we've I think we've pinned it down and I think it will work now. I've had good success with it anyways running it as one shots, but it does really sing when you when you play it as, you know, a three or four shot because part of those stories is about going to strange locations and finding all of the different kind of little nooks and crannies of the world and being able to spend time in that world and, and stretch it out and kind of meander and take it all in, I think is really what the genre is about. And so Lauren has been running kind of like two, three shots of it. And those I know have been going really well for her. Yeah. One of the first things we talked about on our dev editing calls about girl underground was I was like, how long do you intend for these games to go? Right. Because it, in the notes you had put one shot and I was like, nope, that's not going to work. <laughs> like I can tell this is not a one shot just by looking at it. They're like it's a story that wants to breathe, right? Yeah, it does. Oh. It really does. I, I mean, I think there's probably like, I mean, but I'm saying this is somebody who hasn't actually played it yet, but I'm thinking, <laughs> I'm thinking there's a way you could probably like preload the character world creation part, like kind of get that all kind of done beforehand, you know, or kind of like just to make some simple decisions for the players to, you know, have some simple decisions for the players to make, but otherwise it's all kind of ready to go. And then like kind of do, you know, two big encounters and then the finale and make it happen in one shot. But I think it would be too tight. And I don't, you know, and I don't, I don't know. I just, I think the story wants more than that, you know? Yeah. One, one thing that I'll say too, is that one of the elements that people consistently have really enjoyed is the character creation process right? Mm -hmm. because you get so invested in creating this main character, the girl. And then you also have the secondary character that you're creating on top of it. The, the process is, is pretty quick. I mean, it's a few selections, but you do really want that to be a part of part of the game. And I've been really impressed with the, the characters that people have come up with just out of very simple concepts in terms of the playbooks that we have. Can you talk a little bit about like the, Like the manners and all that stuff. Like, I think that'd be really great. I don't think we've talked about that yet on the show. So, so one of the things that that's, or one of the things that's interesting about it is there is no, it's not like an experience driven game. There's no XP in the game really. Instead, what you have is, and I will say none of the companions have any way of like, there's no growth process for them. Like they, other than Mm -hmm. sort of story driven, the girl instead has these things called manners, which are it's a list of at this point eight things that society expects of her. And they're all things like 
young ladies must never tell a lie and young ladies must never soil their hands. And so the process of the girl kind of growing and changing is that she, whenever she makes a move, she can challenge one of those manners or say how she's kind of working against it. And in the process of doing so, she gets to strike it out and create what's called a belief. She has a separate move that is called standing strong in her convictions, which is when she kind of goes up against the big bad or does something where she feels really confident in her abilities rather than just rolling in, you know, plus a stat because the other thing is the girl doesn't have any stats. She gets a die for each belief that she can incorporate into the the game and then picks the two best. So it's kind of like a super advantage. And you, as you go through the game, you're building up more and more beliefs. So it, it leads to this kind of natural end point of the girl almost certainly succeeding, which is what you want to see out of a story like this. Neat. And she's succeeding by shaking off by ultimately by shaking off the sort of like dumb expectations, right? right that like yep. society has for her, which I think is great. Yep. That's exactly so right. Yeah, it's fun. It's been really great. And that's that's been a really um, rewarding process to see, too, as people come up with the beliefs that they think are are worthy replacements for these terrible societal expectations. Well, so excited to hear about Girl Underground and to see kind of how it develops and to continue following it. Where can folks both like find out more information about it and also like what's coming up next with it? Yeah. So um, we're still doing lots of play tests on the Gauntlet calendar. So hop on the calendar and see what what sessions we're running. You can find out more about the game at girlunderground.org. And during the month of February, we're going to be kickstarting a zine version of it. So this will be the little mini version for people to start playtesting and kind of kicking the tires on it and trying it out. And hopefully that leads to new and exciting and bigger things in the future. Sounds very, very cool. We'll keep an eye out for that. Thanks. So my gaming in January, I played Offworlders. Offworld is kind of a, a little space sci-fi game, but like based off World of Dungeons, uh, written by Chris Wolf. It's really, really cool. We were running through Dead Planet, which is a, a kind of en vogue OSR module right now. Uh, we'll, Very we'll neat. Be talking about yeah. that on, yeah. <laughs> we'll be talking about that on Fear of Black Dragon, so stay tuned for that. I played Monster Hearts 2, True Beauty. True Beauty is my uh, 1980s ballroom scene framework for Monster Hearts. I ran a series of games that I was calling gay AF uh, (laughs) January (laughs) where it was where myself and Daryl Ross and friends uh, played uh, several fun gay male romance themed games. Uh, We played, and then they met, uh, which is not necessarily between gay men, but ours was, we did kaleidoscope gay coming of age film. Uh, So we kind of hacked up kaleidoscope to tell a gay coming of age film story. We played Hot Guys Making Out Sherlock, uh, speaking of Lauren, her game, mm-hmm. uh, HGMO Sherlock. I also ran a series of Hearts of Wulin called Dawn of the Winter's Sun. I'm loving Hearts of Wulin. I'm <laughs> so digging it. Well, oh, that's so good. Your game is so good. And it's, I mean, it's it's still like so in development, but it's still so good. I So good that I'm like running it again in, in March. I'm like so, <laughs> I'm so pumped about Hearts of Wulin. It just, I don't even know the genre that well, but I feel like... I can still do it, which I think is what's yeah, so exciting. I like, love the I, stories. I know, melodrama. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. I love melodrama. I love I love chatty telenovela kind of action. Like I love all that, right? Like I like, like I I uh, I'm into it. It is like so my thing. Uh so loving that. I want to talk about HGMO Sherlock. So HGMO stands for Hot Guys Making Out. That is a very classic story game by PH Lee. That takes place during the Spanish Civil War. That's right. And it's about a mysterious, gorgeous nobleman named Honoré. His, frankly, too young looking in the (laughs) art of the book, (laughs) Ward Gonzalvo, and as well, the maid Maria and the butler Olivier. And the whole thrust of the game is every time you play, there's a threat and it's like, you know, something related to the war or something from one of the characters past or something like that. And you have to kind of deal with the threat. But what you're really trying to accomplish is just to have scenes of Honoré and Gonzalvo making out because it's called Hot Guys Making Out. <laughs> Hot Guys Making Out Sherlock is about the the fabulous Baker Street Boys. <laughs> 
<laughs> um, Sherlock, you, you, your four characters are are Sherlock Holmes, who is our top in this case, <laughs> uh, Doctor Watson, who is our bottom, D.I. Lestrade, who in this formulation is a woman, uh, and Mycroft Holmes. Okay, so those are your four characters, and the threats are actually mysteries. They are mysteries that the fabulous Baker Street Boys are trying to solve, but really it's about watching the blossoming romance between Sherlock and Watson, right? So let me talk a little bit about like generally what I love about Hot Guys Making Out. It is one of my absolute favorite games. It's in my top 10 easy. And what I love about it is it has the most interesting structure. The scene structure, you frame a scene up, okay? And then everybody has cards and you play a card and you do a little bit of narration and the cards, depending on their, their suit and their, if they're a face card or not, kind of tell you what sort of thing you can narrate. Right. But the idea is it's very quick narrative beats. So in the rule book, it's described as the panel of a comic book. Okay. So I play a card and maybe I do a couple sentences of internal monologue of Gonzalvo or whatever. And then the next person goes, they play a card and they do a little bit. It's very quick. It's once you get into the rhythm of it, it's enjoyable. It's, it's very like easy to keep up with. And it creates this very particular type of story because you're doing these small, tiny little bits of narration. It actually creates this particular kind of tension at the table. And sometimes you can pass. You don't have to take a turn with your character. If you pass, you can narrate, you can describe the the sound of the, the ticking of the grandfather clock in the room, right? Or the sound of rain beating on the window panes, right? Or even better, you can just sit there quietly <laughs> for 10 seconds <laughs> saying nothing. And then the next person goes. It is this really fantastic, like, tension-building device for a game that's about, like, unspeakable romance. Like, it really, really does it. But occasionally you get to narrate more. There are these, like, uh, kind of power move cards that, that each of the characters can do. And whenever you play one of those cards, you get to do a whole page of the comic book, right? And in in the case of regular HGMO, it's, like, it's usually a scene of honoring and Gonzalo making out. <laughs> so you get to, that gets to be your page of description is them being like intimate with one another. Right. So the game is fantastic. I love it. HGMO Sherlock Lauren's version is so good. Uh, it was the first time I played, I published it a hundred years ago, but it's the first time I played it and it's great. Like the part that really surprised me was the emergent mystery part. I did not see that coming huh. when, when Lauren said in the text, like, you're going to, you're going to create an emergent mystery and also watch Sherlock and Watson fall in love. I was like, okay. But I wasn't thinking like the emergent mystery was going to be like a legit part of the game. I was like, there's no way. I was like, I was like, it's, there's not enough here. Like, how's it going to happen? It works mm -hmm. because the way it goes. So in HGMO, you, you basically, whenever you play an ace, the first ace is like introducing the threat. Okay. The second ace is escalating the threat. And then so forth. And every time you play an ace, it just escalates it more and more. In the emergent mystery context, this is perfect because the first ace is just introducing the mystery that we've all agreed on. Like the mystery is someone claims to have seen a werewolf on the moors or there's a Sherlock and Watson hear a ticking in their their attic, right? <laughs> like that, that's the mystery. And so the second ace you put down we don't really know anything about the mystery, but whoever plays the second ace gets to say, right? They get to deepen it, right? And it's a little bit like Lovecraft-esque, if you've ever played Lovecraft-esque, where after every round in Lovecraft-esque, you get to write down your theory of what you think is happening in the mystery, right? And writing down your theory actually helps inform how you play. It helps you kind of play towards that emergent mystery. This is a very similar situation. When I play my ace, to deepen the mystery, I get to put my thumb on the scale of what I think is going on in the mystery, right? And so it kind of develops, right? Now, 
the point of the game is still to see Sherlock and Watson make out. So it doesn't even matter <laughs> if you solve the mystery. That's the great thing. Like <laughs> the mystery does not have, like you do resolve it to end the game, but at the end of the day, it doesn't matter if it really like seems super coherent because we're just trying to see them be romantic. Right. So it's, it's really good. It, it was so, it was so great. And like the whole day, I just, after we played, this was on Saturday, I just thought about it all day. I was like, gosh, this was so fun. Like it was so fun. I want to play it again. Yeah, HGMO Sherlock is so good. Awesome. It, it really is. One of the things that I love about that game, too, is just the the fact that you have this hand of cards and you you can make decisions about what you play at what point and you know sort of when something is coming, but when you can decide to hold or not on it is right. really yeah. compelling. Yeah, it super is. Like if I'm playing Watson and I have a heart, I know that I can play that heart to have Watson actually say something useful because normally Watson just like <laughs> throws out wrong theories yeah. or just like stumbles about. Right. But with a heart, I can actually say something that's like brilliant insight. So you can kind of hold it, right? It's like, okay, I'm going to hold my heart and get to a moment where, Oh, here's the right moment for, for Watson to be like, well, actually <laughs> I've been, I've been thinking about it, Holmes. And you know, it, it's, you're right. It's so good. It, it's HTMO is a great game to begin with. And HTMO Sherlock just adds a, really interesting like twist to it you know my takeaway from this is i want to see more hgmo skins mm -hmm. i really do i think that this is a game that can work in lots of different contexts as long as it's always about hot guys making out i think <laughs> absolutely I think, I think that's the key <laughs> right i want to see what people can do with it i would love to see i've heard rumors of a batman mm -hmm. robin Ooh. uh Batgirl Alfred like version and I don't know, you know I don't, I've never seen that but I've heard of it but I could see that being you know because we could see Batman and Robin make out who doesn't want to see that do you remember what Codex issue that's in yeah that can be found in Codex Lies and Codex Lies is available on drive through and it's actually part of volume two and volume two is now available on drive through uh, in a bundle so you can get the whole volume two collection for I think the PDF collection is like 40 bucks for the whole set Neat. Folks should definitely go check that out. Why don't we go to the next segment? Hi, listeners. I want to tell you about the Gauntlet Patreon. The Gauntlet is one of the most active, vibrant communities in tabletop role-playing games. We produce podcasts, the Codex Zine, Gauntlet Hangouts, Gauntlet Con, and more. If you love small press, independent tabletop role-playing games, the Gauntlet is for you. And you can help keep things going by pledging to our Patreon. This year, we have four different pledge levels for you to join at, each of which comes with a number of benefits. At the $2 level, you get early access to our actual play podcasts, including Pocket Size Play, as well as a special Keeper of the Gauntlet title. At the $5 level, you also get a PDF of our monthly zine, Codex. Your name and Keeper of the Gauntlet title is listed in the back of each issue of Codex while your pledge is active. At the $6 level, you also get access to the Gauntlet Slack group, which is the heart of our community. And at the $8 level, you get early RSVP access to new game events on Gauntlet Hangouts. The $8 spots are limited based off how many early access players we think the Gauntlet Hangouts calendar can support. Every month on the 15th, we will make a small number of new $8 spots available. So if you want to play games with the Gauntlet, make sure you keep an eye on our Patreon page around that time so you can grab one of those rare spots. Finally, every member of the Gauntlet Patreon, no matter the level they pledge at, gets to attend GauntletCon each year for free. GauntletCon is our incredible online gaming convention, with over 200 game events and panels, competitions and prizes, and our bumpin' GauntletCon Discord server. Folks, we can't do all this awesome stuff without you, so go check out our page and please consider pledging. We're at patreon.com forward slash gauntlet. Thanks. Okay, we are here with our guest segment. Uh, Jesse, we're so happy you're here on the show. What did you want to talk about today? So uh, I was interested in talking in a little bit about trophy, but specifically one of the things that I was thinking about with it is how we can mine the fantasy genre for new and interesting things. Obviously, fantasy is pretty deeply connected to the role-playing game hobby, but it still feels like maybe there's territory that we haven't mined yet. So in Trophy specifically, one of the things that makes it different is that 
whenever you fight something, if you try to fight something, you will die. I'm going to stop you because we have we have never talked about Trophy on the show before. Cool. Tell, tell us about Trophy first. Yeah. So Trophy is a dark fantasy game about doomed treasure hunters going into a haunted forest that doesn't want them there. It's a very rules-like game that's built on Cthulhu Dark and a, with a little bit of Blades in the Dark technology built into it as well. And I've been testing it for quite a while. It's been in, uh, it appeared in Codex Dark 2. And we've been adding new supplements for it ever since. Yeah, our plan is to do um, at least 10 uh, supplements for for Trophy over the course of the next, uh, well, I guess eight months or so. Nice. So based off Cthulhu Dark, I know that the whole thing about Trophy is like they're going into this forest and we know they're fucked. Like that's important to emphasize. (laughs) Like we know they're fucked. They're not. Like the players know that everyone knows that the characters are fucked as in Cthulhu dark yep. and it's structured in these incursions, right? Where every ring of the forest, so to speak, is a deepening of the danger and it's organized around a theme, right? So the one right. that came with in Codex Dark 2, that particular incursion was, had a theme of sleep. And uh, so it has a kind of a, it's the tomb of 10,000 dreams incursion, right? Yeah. Uh, I just want to kind of throw those little extra details in there. Yeah. The Thanks for bringing that up. The so as you mentioned, there are these incursions with these with five rings. So each ring is you get it going deeper and deeper into the forest. And each ring has two things that need to happen in order to move on to the next ring. They're called terrors and temptations. So the terrors are things going wrong, obviously, and the temptations are things that pull them further in despite the terror happening. And each each ring has kind of its own sort of mini theme or thing that that it focuses on. So for example, the first ring is all about building up confidence. So the treasure hunters feel successful, like, hey, we can do this. We're going to accomplish this. It's a simple challenge for them to overcome. And they they feel, in fact, overconfident and then keep going further and further. And then eventually they'll have the environment working against them and the treasure hunters will turn on one another. And then eventually they'll see something monstrous that's that truly terrifies them. And then um, eventually there are psychological horrors where they, they really are all pitted against one another. Right. So it's a nice spiral. <laughs> yep. <laughs> well, so this, this idea that you want to talk about, this idea of like reinterpreting fantasy or recontextualizing fantasy, do I have that right? Yep. Yeah. So talk, t- tell us about that. So as you were mentioning earlier with, with the, the games that both of you have been working on, this idea of combat being less a part of the story or not the core part of the story or not the thing that you want to necessarily spend all of your time on is something that was interesting to me as well as I was working on trophy. Like for me, combat is, is a means to an end and not the whole focus of the story and not what we should be paying attention to. Right. And yet as Lowell, as you saw when you were running city of mist, like that combat can be, can become the story and be, can become the place where things bog down and become the thing that the players focus on for their characters, right? So in Cthulhu Dark, there is this explicit rule that when you fight something, you will die. And so what does it mean to have a fantasy game in the role-playing world where combat is, in fact, taboo? Like the thing that you should not be doing, right? Yeah, instant death, yeah. Yeah, how does that change the game itself and how does it change the way that you approach it you know it's interesting because it's 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 not a unique idea right like right. not to diminish at no, all no. what you're saying here jesse <laughs> but like lamentations of the flame princess right has a fairly standard dnd esque combat framework but like in the presentation of the adventures the difficulty level of the adventures and indeed the various things that are going on they're just the sheer horror of it it's assumed you're not going to fight, right? Like it's assumed you are going to run and you are going to not get involved. And if you do get involved, you're crazy, right? So, so it's not, it's definitely not an original idea as far as that goes. But I do think that trophy, I like how explicit it is in trophy and in Cthulhu Dark, like this mechanical enforcement of like, if you fight, you will die. <laughs> like you mm-hmm. don't have a chance, right? You, you know, and so you must find something else to do, right? I think that really, really ramps up the stakes. And I think it, places it creates a fantasy that i'm into right which is terrible horrifying monsters should (laughs) fucking kill you right Right. they should i don't care like how dexterous or skilled your hobbit thief is if you are going up against a fucking you know a a multi-tentacled 
globular horror, they should probably fucking die, right? Like, right. <laughs> like, and it's and it's this idea of like this. It's this holdover of like combat and like predictable character death that kind of makes it to where that the, the Hobbit has a chance of defeating it, right? And it just doesn't. I don't know. Like, it doesn't ring true to me, right? Like, it can be fun. I'm not saying that's not fun, but I'm saying that like. If we were if we were meant to have like a measure of believability with these things, you know, truly horrific things should be, you know, in a Lovecraftian way, should not be defeatable, right? And it's a philosophy, it's a it's a viewpoint, you know, right? Yeah, I mean, o- o- the OSR mindset is one that says high lethality is should be expected, right? Like your characters probably will die, but I think that that's different than your characters will die, right? If you go into it with that doomed sensibility you know, similar to something like 10 candles, it makes you play to lose, right? It makes you want it creates to... space for a different kind of play. Exactly. Right? That's what it yeah. does. A different kind of experience. You know, what strikes me is that in terms of sort of non RPG elements, but, but sort of related is there's that long and rich history of the, the point and click adventure games, mm-hmm. emulate all kinds of genres where, Combat isn't a thing. You go, you click, you click by the monster, you die. And that, that so much of those are built on that high lethality or you just you can't do it that way. You've got to find another story. You've got to find another approach. You've got to find another way to explore this. And it's, that reminds me a little bit of that. Yeah, absolutely. And that's one thing that, that we've seen in the playtests that we've been doing too is that when the focus isn't on combat, when, the, when you know your character is doomed – it does make you play and interact with the world in a very different way, right? It is it is more focused on exploration. It is more focused on how what is my demise going to be and how is it going to come about and how do I sort of push myself to that point? How do I play in a, in a dangerous way and how do I – how does that change me? Yeah. You know, I'm going to run Trophy this week. The first time I, I'm running it is in a few days and – what I'm really interested to see is the players knowing that their characters are doomed. Like you said, how does that change their thinking? How does that change their approach? And indeed, it begs the question, what are we doing here, right? Mm-hmm. If, the, if the players know their characters are doomed, what causes them to push deeper, Right. Well, they're doing it because that's the game, right? Like they, they don't have a choice. That's what we're doing, right? There's that part of it. But setting that aside – what I'm hoping happens is players say, okay, I'm doomed. And the GM has just told me I've been afflicted with this strange paranoia. So now knowing that I'm doomed and knowing that I'm afflicted with a strange paranoia, I'm going to find my fun in playing out that strange paranoia, right? That's where mm-hmm. my fun is coming from. That's what I'm hoping happens with trophy. Has that been your experience? Yeah, it has. I keep seeing players catching themselves. So just like Cthulhu dark, it uses this, uh, Cthulhu dark, Cthulhu dark is called insanity or insight, but in trophy it's called ruin. And it's this six level track that you're rolling dice. And if it's, if it's higher than you take over and you're getting closer and closer and closer to six, which is your end point. And I continued to see players do this thing where they're like, uh, I don't know if I want to make that roll. Oh, wait. Yes, I do. Yes, I definitely want to take that risk and make that roll. That happens in Cthulhu Dark all the time. The players get so been out of shape. Not been out of shape, but they, they get, they're a little rueful and a little like like slightly disappointed if their character doesn't hit the max on their insight, right? <laughs> right. Like they, they want to go, they want to break that, that. I'm hoping that will happen with trophy too. That's my, that's my grand hope. Too. And even if, even when it doesn't, it's still very satisfying. Uh, I was just having a conversation with someone on the Slack the other day about, uh, they were asking like, should I, should I expect that everyone will be dead at the end? And I said, usually yes, <laughs> but, uh, we just, we, we just had a game where everyone survived and it was in a lot of ways so much worse, right? We had one yeah. character, we had one character who um, sacrificed their name and so didn't know who they were anymore. We had one character who inadvertently murdered his brother, which was the person he was trying to, he was going on this 
Expedition 4. And we had one person who was like kind of cursed to wander the forest forever. So none of them died. And yet their fates were all so much worse than than they would have been had they died. <laughs> Fucking grim. And I love it. Oh, my God. That's <laughs> that's the grim shit I'm here for. This is super great. I mean, is there anything else you want to say here? I guess what I would say more broadly is just that I think I know there are, there are all of these sort of like uh, reimaginings of what what fantasy is and what it could be what it could be. And I do think that I still think there's stuff there to mine. I still think there's so much. Yeah, I know it. I agree. People say, oh, I read it all the time. Oh, fantasy. We're so inundated with fantasy. There's too much fantasy. No, there's still so much space with fantasy. Like I don't buy for a minute. Like, okay, maybe we have enough D&D clones. All right. I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll agree to that. But, like, but, but there's so much more like to do. I agree completely. Yeah. So I'm just excited to see what else comes out of this this rethinking, like just pulling back everything you know about how fantasy should work and what our expectations are for role playing games. Like, what are the stories that we're interested in telling? What are the what are the emergent stories that we can tell? And how do we build mechanics that help support new and different retellings of this of this genre? We should say real quickly that trophy is available in Codex Dark 2. Uh, currently not available. Uh, Codex Dark 2 is presently out of circulation from Patreon, uh, but it will be... Codex Dark 2 comes out in March. So March 1st, it will be on drive through So people will be able to pick it up again then on drive through In the meantime, you can get all of those nifty additional, those supplements that we're producing every month for it. Um, we have other authors writing different incursions, writing new classes, writing treasures. It's really great because it's actually like, Jesse's written this like really cool core, you know, this like core game. And then people are kind of like just continually like adding nuance and texture to it and i think that's i think that's pretty, it's, it's pretty really terrific. exciting yeah it's really exciting my my favorite incursion jim it's jim crocker right yes <laughs> i was yeah, just gonna say it, yeah it's it's like moss it's like a moss based incursion it's with a theme so of good. hunger oh, it's yeah. so cool yeah it's so so um, good and gross yeah i love yeah. it yeah uh, yeah i'm here for it awesome well i don't think i have any, this is great this is interesting uh Lowell, do you have mm-hmm. anything to say or no no cool let's go to give me life it's giving me life. Lol, it's giving you life. So I've been playing the Yakuza series on the PlayStation 4. This is an older series from about 10 years ago. They've done uh, some remakes of them, Yakuza Kiwami and Yakuza Kiwami 2. And they did even did a prologue game. And these are incredibly problematic. <laughs> <laughs> Why am I not surprised? <laughs> yeah, there's some gay panic stuff in a few places, as you oh, get in great. a lot of these Japanese yeah. games. There's, but but then there's some really like like at one like NPC interaction, you interact with this woman in a host club who's having issues dealing with her sexuality, and and you know she's gay, and you know and and your character's trying to help her find her identity and all this stuff, and you go through this long passage where she finally kind of comes to terms with. You know, being a lesbian and your reward is you get this uh, a video of her in a bikini. <laughs> um, <laughs> literally. OK. Uh, Yakuza Kiwami, uh, Yakuza Zero has all these great female NPCs. You're like, oh, these are all really well detailed and, and they, they're all really interesting and have all have these stories. And then you realize they're all modeled on Japanese porn stars. <laughs> you know, <laughs> the, the, the Japanese market has to be served, lol. Yeah, just, it's, yeah. But I will say, that aside, the, the overall story of the Yakuza games, they're solid. They're great stories, complicated, great interactions, twists and things like that. And the basic gameplay is is a, is a runaround beat-em-up that is really – it's a, it, the, the gameplay is solid. And I – it's – it's like Bayonetta, but with toxic masculinity. <laughs> um, uh, and I would say if, if you're at all interested, Yakuza Kiwami, the first one, is is dynamite. Just just dynamite. Can we talk about gay panic for a minute? Yeah. The people who are afflicted with gay panic are the kind of people who most gay guys I know would not want to get with. Like, let's just throw that out there, okay? <laughs> like, it's like, girl – nobody was into you right like in the first place it was not going to happen so yeah they, they've got a lot of stuff it's interesting because they they present some very some caricatures of gay you know as you get in these japanese games the main character is like whatever but you can see other people reacting negatively to them it's so weird it's so weird <laughs> yeah. jesse what's giving you life 
So I was going to originally, I was going to throw out the Netflix series Sex Education, which is oh, so, so good. good. Oh, my God, it's so, so good. good. I love it's it so, so good. much. Yeah. But I feel like I have to uh, I have to talk about the weekend that I just had. So we have this annual tradition amongst us and some family friends and stuff of driving three hours north to a uh, cabin, a series of cabins in the woods in the middle of winter in Minnesota. And... <laughs> And uh, just hanging out near and playing Hugh, near games. Near Hugo, Minnesota? Uh, no, for, further north. <laughs> okay. So we just hang out and play games, and it's a fun family tradition. This weekend, it was negative 35 degrees. Oh, fuck. And so <laughs> wow. we, didn't, we didn't go outside, which we sometimes do. Instead, I uh, brought some little old tabletop miniatures and boards and taught a bunch of uh, four through nine year olds, how to do role playing games, which was nice. so much fun. Yeah, yep. that's cool. Very simple dice, very simple, like describing what they what they see and having them help me paint the scene. And uh, it was nice. it was excellent. Yeah, it was so good. much fun. Yeah. And then all of their parents were like, "What is this game you are playing? And how do we <laughs> do it?" And that was just such a such a great and life affirming thing to be able to participate in. Excellent. Nice. The thing giving me life is mastering Twitter. <laughs> so um, somebody, I think it was Ludo, I can't remember who, some, someone in the community was saying, I'm listening to the old episodes of the Gauntlet podcast and hearing Jason talk about how he doesn't know anything about Twitter and he's and he sucks at Twitter. And and just I want to yell at the, I want to yell at the recording, like, you're going to be so good at Twitter someday <laughs> because I've mastered it. I, I, I have figured out Twitter and it's good. Like I have... I have learned how to leverage Twitter as a tool for finding new membership, as a tool for putting our values out there, as mm -hmm. a tool for yes. creating discussion, creating discussion about role playing games. I've got like, I've got like four hot Twitter threads going on right now as of this recording of different like just questions and just theory discussions about role playing games and different things. I, I'm introducing the world to the labyrinth move today. Like, mm -hmm. like people are really loving the labyrinth move. Role playing game Twitter is really good. Like I know in the in the culture we're all supposed to hate Twitter, <laughs> like Twitter is like the <laughs> devil or whatever, and and it, and it is a bad place in a lot of ways. But role playing game Twitter is really really good. Yeah, like it's it is. Don't you think? Well, it's really. Oh solid. Yeah, I, yeah, I love it. I've never said a bad thing about Twitter because I've I've found so many great RPG people on there. Yeah, uh, yeah. that I wouldn't have seen otherwise, and artists and 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 thinkers yeah. and stuff that I dig. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's that's been my experience too the last year. Really, really doing it heavy. So, um, yeah, mastering Twitter is making me happy, and also giving me life. <laughs> <laughs> well, listeners, that's our show. We are so happy to bring it to you. Um, if you'd like to get in touch with us on Twitter, it's at Gauntlet RPG. Go find us there. We have a website. It's Gauntlet RPG dot com. We are on Patreon at Patreon dot com forward slash Gauntlet. Hey. Maybe you don't have a couple bucks to spare for the Patreon, but you still want to support the show. That's cool. We love that. Go to iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts and leave us a rating or a review. That's a fabulous way of supporting the show if you can't kick over some money. And yeah, I think that's it for where we're at. Jesse, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Lowell, thank you as always. A pleasure. And listeners, thank you. Take care. 